He justifies what he did because he says he was, he became victimized by people talking about his sexual orientation at school, and yet then he turned around and victimized these other kids who ended up facing uh, what he went through on a much grander scale. New Berlin is a small city in southeastern Wisconsin. Roughly 15 miles east of Milwaukee, New Berlin is a city in Waukesha County with a population of just under 40,000. More than one publication has literally described it as a town where everybody knows one another, where reputation can either carry you far or wrap around your foot like an anchor and sink you. Like a large chunk of the American Midwest, New Berlin is pretty conservative in that it is a city built on small town values. It is about as middle class as you can get, being ranked by CNN Money Magazine as number 34 in a list of America's top 100 small towns to live in. To some of the kids in New Berlin though, the area can be boring. Like I said, reputation carries a lot of weight throughout the area. Local teenagers and young adults refer to New Berlin as the bubble, due to everything often being stuck inside of it. The area only has one school district which itself only has two high schools. One of those two high schools is New Berlin Eisenhower Middle and High School, nicknamed Ike by locals. Ike's athletic program, which has brought home several state championships, used to be what the school was best known for, at least until the events of 2008. Anthony Stansel, nicknamed Tony by friends and family, was the student at New Berlin Eisenhower. Going into the school year of 2008 to 2009, he was a senior. Tony was considered a good student by almost everyone that knew him. He was described as a high achiever in an article written in the New York Times, which detailed how he thrived in political science classes. He also happened to be an honor student. He was also very geeky, serving as the reigning history champ for the school's academic decathlon. Tony also worked as a software engineer after school hours. Tony was described as being very normal while at school. Those that worked with him outside of school say that in addition to acting very normal for a young man his age, he showed serious signs of promise. He was very good at putting on a good face for adults, and he was able to stay in the good graces of those in authority. A software developer that worked with Tony after school hours stated that he has a personality that can magnetize with people. He can tell them what they want to hear in a way that's perfect for networking. But underneath this veneer was a more complicated character emerging. Tony was described as being very awkward around those his own age, especially with the girls. A female student said about him, he would try to flirt with you and it would be like creepy. He would say things that would bring the conversation to a total stop, and you'd look at him and wonder, what was that about? In addition to this perceived awkwardness around girls, Tony also had some personality traits that made it hard for others his own age to empathize with him. Some thought of him as being a bit lazy, and he was known to love attention. In 2008, he had helped organize some local volunteers for presidential candidate Barack Obama's campaign and he would later begin telling kids that he had worked for Barack Obama. He also loved to name drop, stating that he had a relative that knew Vice President Dick Cheney, and he had a whole bunch of big money connections for his future job prospects, all of which just made his fellow students roll their eyes or cringe. Anthony Stansel did not ever really shy away from the fact that he came from a wealthy family. He lived with his family in country estates, one of the better neighborhoods in all of New Berlin. He even wrote on his MySpace page for the entire world to see. Some people consider me rich, but I don't like that saying. I prefer financially fortunate, lol. The year before, Tony had driven a blue Audi A4, which was given to him by his family.
but that summer he had sold the car in order to raise money for a potential trip to Peru, which never came to fruition. He instead spent the money on a 42-inch plasma screen TV to hang up in his bedroom, and used the rest of the money to buy a rundown green Honda Civic for the coming school year. Rumors persisted that Tony, who was known for being incredibly awkward, might have actually been gay. I only say this because it became a point of resentment between Tony and other students, as they would often pick on him for it. After all, in the preceding years, Tony had himself made fun of Ike's only other gay student. After this began to be speculated among other students, Tony quickly found himself ostracized and without many friends to rely upon. Despite all of this drama unfolding behind the scenes, though, Tony had no major issues. At least, until November of 2008. On November 12th, 2008, two New Berlin Eisenhower students reported to a teacher what they had seen in a bathroom. The phrase, BOMB 111408, was written on the wall above a urinal in the downstairs boys' bathroom, an alleged threat against the school and everyone in it. The teacher then forwarded the threat to school principal Michael Fessenmeyer, who had never had to deal with a bomb threat at Ike. He had been the school's principal for over four years, and this was his first. He began reaching out to the known school troublemakers, suspecting that they might have been involved in this. Perhaps some wisecrack was just trying to get a day off of school, or something like that. However, it seemed to the principal that none of the regulars were responsible for this. That was when the threat was forwarded to the police, early that Wednesday morning. Tony Stansel, who was not supposed to have his cell phone on during school hours, actually ended up live-tweeting the bomb scare in his classroom, as police officers began searching the campus for any sign of a bomb. 7.28 AM. School is like prison now. No one is allowed in the halls unless they are supervised. Cops are in the hallways, too. 9.04 AM. Update. School is officially on lockdown. I hate being suppressed. 1.28 p.m. Maybe we will have off tomorrow, since the bomb is supposed to go off tomorrow. Throughout the next day or so, things at New Berlin Eisenhower continued on, as if nothing had changed. The school was on heightened alert, but students from grades 7 through 12 assembled for class, and treated this Thursday like any other. Despite rumors spreading throughout the school, perpetuated by comments like Tony's tweets from the days prior. School officials were not expecting any actual trouble. However, the bomb threat had explicitly named November 14th as the day in which an alleged bomb would go off. So, if something was going to happen, it would be that Friday. School principal Mike Fessenmeyer and New Berlin superintendent Paul Kreutzer struggled to determine whether or not they should cancel school that Friday. Police had found no evidence that there was a bomb on campus, but they argued that you could never be too safe when it came to the lives of children. However, if they were to actually cancel school, they would definitely be setting a poor precedent, and perhaps make way for many more bomb scares throughout the school year. By that afternoon, both had come to the conclusion that school would move forward the next day as if nothing had changed. But, at 5.43 p.m., that changed when Kreutzer, Fessenmeyer, and a school teacher at New Berlin Eisenhower received an email from an unusual email address. These emails read, Good luck tomorrow. Boom. It won't be your average one either. It will be one that is manned, not by me, but by those who follow me. New Berlin Eisenhower High School. Needless to say, school the next day was cancelled. Breaking news now at 10, violent threats calls the school to cancel class tomorrow. Lauren Lemanchek is live in New Berlin Eisenhower. Lauren, what led to this decision? Well, Mike, the district administrator tells me he is not happy at all about having to cancel classes here at Eisenhower High School and Middle School. But tonight they received an email, a second more specific threat about tomorrow, and he felt it was a precaution he needed to take. Administrators at New Berlin Eisenhower have been trying to handle a bomb threat scrawled in the boys' bathroom for the last two days. 
they didn't think it had much credibility. Many students blew it off. But there's this big assembly tomorrow, so some of them are like worried, but I don't think anyone is really taking it like seriously. Police swept the school yesterday and today with plans for another thorough inspection tomorrow. The school has been on lockdown. Extra squads have also been assigned to the area. That was enough for this mom. And I really trust the administration there and the kids were fine. But tonight, after a second notice was sent to a handful of people, including today's TMJ4, New Berlin's leaders began to rethink their decision. The head of the district told me he and police have decided they just can't take the risk, so they opted late this evening to cancel school. They need more time to ensure safety. There is a reward of $1,000 being offered for information. The police say they have a few solid leads and they are fully intending to find the people responsible for this. On Friday, November 14th, 2008, without any students or staff clogging up the classrooms and hallways, a full search was conducted by the local police bomb unit. They looked through every possible air vent, through closets, lockers, everything. They could find no trace of a bomb or any explosive material. Police were able to quickly trace the threatening email to an IP address nearby from the New Berlin Public Library, which was only about two and a half miles away from the high school. There, they spoke to a library employee who provided a physical description of the young man who had been using the computer which sent the email in the time period in which it was sent. He was described as being short, tan, slightly chubby, having short dark hair, and a nose that was above average in size. A quick look at library records revealed that this young man's name was Anthony Stansel. Police went to the Stansel family home in Country Estates, where they spoke to Anthony. He confessed to police, saying that he had sent in the email as a safety precaution. He said that he had not made the original bomb threat in the boys' bathroom, but felt like school officials were not taking it seriously enough. He said that he had sent the email to Principal Fessenmeyer, Superintendent Kreutzer, and his science teacher because he wanted to save lives. Tony was suspended from school, pending a further investigation by police officials, but the worst was yet to come, and it would make Tony's little email scare look like a walk in the park. Adam is a pseudonym I am giving for a young man that lived in New Berlin, Wisconsin. Adam was 15 years old, and randomly, he was befriended by a young woman online. The girl, who was named Kayla, sent Adam a Facebook friend request. He accepted, seeing that their profiles came from the same city, and they began sending regular messages to one another. Kayla seemed to be flirty, perhaps a little too flirty. It surprised Adam, but in a good way. In the way that a teenage boy who thinks he just won a winning lottery ticket can be surprised. Kayla said that she was a junior at Adam's school. She said that she had a crush on him, but was too shy to say hello. So, they continued a little back and forth. Quickly, their messages began getting more risque and raunchy. Kayla asked for explicit photos of Adam. He responded positively. He gave in to her request, and took some rather provocative photos of himself to send to her. In return, Kayla took some photos of her own, in which her face was always cropped out. She said that she cropped out her face because she was shy, and did not feel comfortable sending fully revealing photos of herself. In some part of Adam's brain, this made sense. So he kept communicating with this young woman. In some way, this likely appealed to his burgeoning masculine side. He wasn't afraid to show his face in his photos. So, they kept flirting, and both continued sending provocative photos of one another. Eventually, though, this began to take a very dark turn. Adam learned from one of his friends that this girl, Kayla, had been sending similar messages to another friend of theirs. This made him doubt the validity of the girl he had been exchanging risque messages with, but he continued to hold out hope that he had won the jackpot. Shortly thereafter, Kayla began telling Adam that 
After sending so many nude and half-nude photos of himself over the internet, he had made himself a target. Essentially, Kayla, as she was known, began to blackmail him. Kayla told Adam that all of those photos he had sent would find their way to his family and friends unless he gave in to her demands. Her demand, at the time, was simple. She wanted Adam to meet up with a friend of hers and let them perform oral sex on him. In time, he would learn that this friend of Kayla's was another young man. Adam, not knowing what to do, decided to give in to Kayla's outrageous demand. After all, he was just beginning his life. The internet was something new and adventurous, and Adam had already run afoul of one of its basic rules. Never trust a stranger. Naked photos of him were now circling the internet, and his entire reputation, his entire future, seemed to be in this stranger's hands. In his 15-year-old mind, he had no other option. So, Adam decided to meet up with the mysterious young man, this friend of Kayla's, who called himself Tony at a public library. Tony was another young man, just a year or two older than Adam. Tony made it seem like he was as much a victim as Adam was. He said that he too was being forced into doing this against his will. He said that he had also run afoul of Kayla, and there was no way out but to give in to her demands. So, in a bathroom stall of the public library, Adam was pressured into having oral sex performed upon him by this other young man. Tony, the young man pressuring him, documented everything on a digital camera he had brought along with him. He said he needed to do this in order to appease Kayla. Adam hoped that this would be a one-time deal, that he would only have to endure this activity once, and then he could wash his hands of it and Kayla forever. However, the mysterious presence on the other end, this enigmatic Kayla, did not feel the same way. She thought that the pictures weren't exploitative enough, weren't clear enough. She demanded Adam to do the same thing again, and again, and then again. Each time, Adam was forced to meet up with Tony, the young man who had pressured him into receiving oral sex. Their encounters escalated, from Adam receiving oral sex, to him giving oral sex, and then much more. Eventually, Tony pretended to be one of Adam's friends, and, with his family in another room, the two had intercourse in Adam's family's home. In all of these meetups, Tony had a digital camera to document the encounters. Eventually, Kayla began insisting that Adam begin taking provocative photos of his younger brother, all but ensuring that he too would become another one of her victims. Adam could not stand that. He had finally had enough. Kayla crossed the line when she began talking about Adam's brother, and he finally came clean. He informed authorities about what had been taking place. The meetups with this mysterious Tony, the pictures he had sent to the mysterious Kayla, the digital camera, everything. This happened to correlate almost exactly with the New Berlin Eisenhower bomb scare, which had just brought a young man named Anthony Stansel into police crosshairs. On November 17, 2008, the Monday after the new Berlin Eisenhower bomb scare, local police asked Anthony Stansel to bring in his cell phone and his computer. Because of the bomb scare he had emailed in, they wanted to go through his records and make sure there wasn't anything incriminating that they could find. At least, that was what they told him. Little did Tony know that police were suspecting him of involvement in a sexual assault case that they were investigating which involved another young man matching his description, who also happened to be named Tony. In a small town like New Berlin, Wisconsin, this was likely not just a coincidence. Computer analysts and forensic computer investigators began looking through the documents and files on Tony's computer and cell phone, looking for any sign of wrongdoing. It wasn't long until they found many signs of wrongdoing. The computer belonging to Anthony Stansel, the 18-year-old senior from New Berlin Eisenhower High contained child pornography. Lots of child pornography, most of which appeared to be self-made. On his computer were 39 separate folders, each of which had the name of a student from the school he went to. Each folder contained multiple pictures of the students in various forms of undress. In some cases, the boys were fully nude. 
In total, there were 300 photos, as well as multiple video clips of the young men who were engaged in sexual activities. In some cases, the sexual activity was with Anthony himself. Police were able to determine that the age of the boys cataloged on this computer ranged from 13 to 18. They were also able to determine that 50 boys had been a victim of a scheme orchestrated by Anthony Stansel, 39 of which sent him partially undressed photos, and at least 31 sent him photos that were defined as sexually explicit. Investigators quickly figured out that Anthony Stansel had used three separate identities in the execution of this scheme. The main identity he used, a fictional one, was the mysterious Kayla that had corresponded with the 15-year-old named Adam, whose story I just told you. However, he had also used the identity of two girls named Emily, both of whom were real students at New Berlin Eisenhower, who also happened to be friends with Anthony Stansel. He had created fake social media pages for both, and had used their real names and faces to lure young men from the school that they shared. At the end of the day, Police had just uncovered what was perhaps one of the biggest sex scandals in Wisconsin history. In the ensuing investigation, police uncovered that at least seven of Tony's victims, the young men he had catfished through social media pages, had been sexually assaulted. Two were 15 years old, three were 16 years old, one was 17, and another was the same age as Tony, 18. Tony had baited these young men into sending him provocative pictures, leading them to believe that he was a young girl from New Berlin Eisenhower. Once they had sent him enough exploitative pictures, which were, more often than not, child pornography, Tony would use these photos to blackmail them into performing sexual acts with him. These sexual assaults had happened in homes of the victims, public parks, the library, and even in the parking lot of New Berlin Eisenhower. All of this was happening under everyone's nose, but because the victims were impressionable, scared young men, they felt like they had no one to turn to. After being presented with the evidence police had collected against him, Anthony Stansel came clean. He confessed to police, but only after trying to muddy the waters. He originally claimed that the three social media pages belonging to the two Emilys and the Kayla profile he had created, were real. He even said that Kayla was a friend of his, before getting caught up in his manufactured lie. Tony said that he had been bullied in the past, and the last six months, when police believed the scheme began, had seen him getting bullied for being gay. He told police that he had always been bisexual and unsure of himself, but recent events had caused him to begin lashing out. Needless to say, Police were anything but pleased by his excuse and response to the allegations laid out against him. On February 4, 2009, Brad Schimmel, the district attorney for Waukesha County, announced that a dozen felony charges were being filed against Anthony Stansel, including multiple counts of sexual assault on children, possession of child pornography, five counts of child enticement, and one charge of causing a bomb scare. The charges were filed against 18-year-old Anthony Stansel, who had duped at least 31 students into sending nude photos of themselves. Some of his victims were listed as being 13 years old. Stansel's scheme, which Schimmel referred to as sinister and malicious, had resulted in Stansel sexually assaulting at least seven boys, whom he had blackmailed into engaging in unwanted sexual acts with him. If found guilty of all charges, Anthony Stansel would be facing close to 300 years behind bars. Of course, he would plead not guilty to all of the charges. Right now at 6, a devious crime in New Berlin. Anthony Stansel is accused of targeting classmates for sex, and how he did it is shocking. Authorities took Stansel's computer after he was accused of making a bomb threat at New Berlin Eisenhower High School, and when they inspected that computer, they found that he had posed as a girl online and was able to get teenage boys to send him nude pictures of themselves. He, he used those pictures as blackmail. He coerced maybe as many as seven victims into performing sex acts. And 
a total of 31 victims have been identified so far. There may be many more. The victims range in age from 13 to 19, all that according to the criminal complaint. Details coming to light tonight for the first time after this two-month-long investigation. Detectives say Anthony Stansel systematically blackmailed fellow students into performing sex acts. It started with a bomb scare. Detectives believe 18-year-old Anthony Stansel emailed the threat that shut down New Berlin Eisenhower High School last November. But when they started looking at his computer, they claim they found much worse. It has frankly made the original bomb scare that started all of this really pale by comparison. Investigators say Stansel posed as a girl to convince other male students to email him nude pictures. They say Stansel then used those photos to blackmail the boys. Police say Stansel tricked at least 31 young men and boys from age 13 to 19 to email nude pictures. They believe he coerced at least seven boys to perform sex acts at places like the New Berlin Library, public parks, a high school bathroom, and in parked cars on secluded streets. The allegation shocked even this court magistrate. In this court's seven and a half years on the bench, this is the most horrific complaint the court has ever reviewed. We caught up with Stansel's father after the court appearance. Do you have anything to say about these allegations? No, I don't, not at this time. Can you sir. understand why other parents might be horrified by this? Of course I can. Now school administrators worry there may be more victims. Students and anyone who might be out there, seek out your favorite teacher, your coach, a guidance counselor, the administration, we are here to listen and help. And the district attorney tells me that Anthony Stansel started using his computer to download child porn and coerce sex acts almost two years ago when he was only 16 years old. Now Stansel faces almost 300 years worth of felony charges. By the time the charges were announced against Tony Stansel, the reputation of new Berlin Eisenhower was damaged beyond repair. By the spring of 2009, this burgeoning scandal was the thing that the school itself was most well known for. It seemed like all of its athletic and academic achievements were in the wind. At sporting events, opposing fans would begin chanting, Facebook, as a mockery of the abuse suffered at the hands of the young victims. Susan Selvick, the mother of two Eisenhower High students, stated, It was beyond what the kids could imagine, you know? They see a lot of things. They go to the theater and everything else, but this is so shocking. The acts perpetrated by Tony Stansel had seemingly ruined the reputation of the town, and in an effort to recover and rebound, this story quickly found itself becoming the area's dirty little secret. Greg Heimerl, who was then a student at Eisenhower High, said, If it is talked about, it's very briefly. It's, have you heard the story? Yes or no, and it ends there. The young men at the center of the story, who had inadvertently found themselves victimized by Tony Stansel, had their identities held from the press. And for good reason. You do not release the names of minors without good cause. And you always take the victim's feelings into account. In a conservative-minded town like New Berlin, a scandal like this could ruin a young man's life. Unfortunately, the court documents, which redacted most of their compromising information, used their birthdays as identifiers. Other kids that went to Eisenhower High were able to plug these birthdays into the same social media sites where the young men had originally been victimized, and were able to find out exactly who these victims were. In essence, these young men, who had been blackmailed, extorted, and then repeatedly sexually abused by Anthony Stansel, were outed. The court records were quickly sealed, and the information was redacted, but the damage had already been done. Anybody who wanted to know who these young men were could just ask someone else who had already put in five minutes of internet sleuthing. For Superintendent Kreutzer and other school officials, this was just the beginning of a long and arduous process, where they began to ask themselves if this was something they could have nipped in the bud long ago. Quote, What did we do? Was there anything we could have changed? A lot of people have asked me how this could happen. Unfortunately, he could provide no answers to any of these questions. As the trial of Anthony Stansel approached, more evidence about the young man came to light. It was learned, and then publicly announced, 
that he had a previous juvenile conviction for sexual assault. The incident, which had happened in 2004, had taken place while Tony was babysitting a three-year-old. Apparently, this had happened on multiple occasions, and resulted in Tony getting in trouble as a teenager. This was ultimately kept under wraps, as juvenile criminal records usually are. Brad Schimmel, the county's district attorney, stated that, There were efforts at sex offender treatment then. It was a bit of a bumpy road with Stancil. Making admissions, withdrawing those admissions, proceeding in that fashion all the way. He was able to complete his supervision, and then a couple of years afterward, we see these incidents happen. The prosecution submitted this evidence as proof of a pattern, that this was not some series of events isolated to the past year or two. This went back to Tony's earliest teenage years. As part of their legal strategy, the defense submitted several motions for the court to consider Anthony's clinical depression. He said that he had been on depression medication for several years, predating all of the sexual assault incidents. And in a startling revelation, Tony's defense lawyers alleged that he had been sexually assaulted by an older boy upon entering high school. This alleged incident, which had apparently warped Tony's already fragile emotional state, became what had plunged him into a world of misery. He claims that after this incident, he started to get harassed by numerous kids at school, who teased him on his sexuality, something he was already insecure with. Craig Kuhari, Tony's lawyer, told the court that he had a strong desire to fit in with everyone. I think that was why he went to the great length he did to appear that he wasn't gay and was just a victim of extortion like they were. He was never comfortable with the fact that he was bisexual, so he came up with an elaborate scheme to cover that to appear to be a normal heterosexual teen. Despite their best efforts, the lawyers for the defense must have known that they were waging an unwinnable war. There was no legal argument to excuse a lengthy period of premeditated, calculated sexual assaults. But it was Tony's only shot to gain a possibility of freedom in his lifetime. In December of 2009, it was announced that lawyers for Anthony Stansel had accepted a plea deal on his behalf. A plea deal that would help the victims of Tony avoid having to give open court testimony. Waukesha County District Attorney Brad Schimmel stated, alongside this announcement, I contacted each and every one of the victims in this matter, and each of them felt that this was a very positive resolution of the case. It was important for them that this be resolved before the holidays. Frankly, Judge, I've never had a case where the victims and their families were more apprehensive about testifying than in this case. There has been an enormous amount of publicity, maybe unprecedented in a child sexual assault case, and all happening in a school where all of the victims went, along with the defendant. From the victim's perspective, they're relieved we're doing this. The terms of the plea deal meant that Anthony Stansel was admitting guilt to two counts of sexual assault. He pleaded no contest to third-degree sexual assault, as well as repeated sexual assault against the same child. Because of this, the other charges would be dropped, but would still be considered during sentencing. This meant that he could spend upwards of 20 years behind bars, with the possibilities ranging up towards 50. District Attorney Brad Schimmel said that he was going to push for the biggest possible sentence allowed, in the hopes of making a statement to other sexual predators. Breaking news from Waukesha, a new Berlin teenager gets 15 years in prison for blackmailing classmates into having sex with him. Just before 5 o'clock, a judge sentenced 19-year-old Anthony Stancil after he pled no contest to repeated sexual assault of a child. Prosecutors say Stancil posed as a girl online, then tricked dozens of his male classmates into sending him naked pictures of themselves. Now, Stancil then used those pictures to blackmail the boys into performing sex acts with him. The district attorney asked for substantial Financial prison time, Stancil read a statement to the court apologizing to his family and his victims. I am deeply, deeply sorry 
for the pain and suffering I have caused you and your family. I cannot imagine or even begin to understand how much of an impact my actions have had on you. A little over a year after emailing a bomb scare to a teacher and two school officials, Anthony Stansel was sentenced to 15 years in prison. The two counts he pled guilty to gave him a decade and a half behind bars, as well as an additional 13 years of extended supervision. An excerpt from an article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel read, Waukesha County Circuit Judge J. Mac Davis imposed this sentence because he said, Stansel has proven he was manipulative, excessively self-centered, and could still be dangerous. I am afraid of what he can and might do, Davis said. Because of the terms of his sentence, Anthony Stansel would not be eligible for early release. He would be, and is currently, serving his entire sentence in the Wisconsin state prison system. Almost immediately, comments and remarks by those in the press began to insinuate that, beyond his prison sentence, Anthony Stansel was going to be targeted in jail for sexual assaults. Not only was this sentiment shared jokingly in online comments, it was made by officials close to the case. Craig Kuhari, Tony's own lawyer, spoke to the press and admitted that there was little that he, or anyone, could do on behalf of Tony's safety. Quote, We've got to hope that the institution takes the right steps by putting him with similarly classified inmates. There's little that we can do to protect him. He's going to have to adapt to that new life. He's street smart, savvy. There are manipulative qualities to his personality. He might be able to do quite well in that environment. Brad Schimmel, the district attorney for Waukesha County, responded directly to the prison rape fears and jokes. Quote, Tony's going to a place, given the length of his sentence, where there are some people with some serious records and a history of violence. That is a potential danger. The prison system, they work hard to prevent violence in prisons, but I don't think they could prevent everything in prison, the way we can't in society. That is not my hope, but we do acknowledge that is a possibility. I would be terrified. Anthony Stansel, who has been behind bars since 2009, when he was just entering adulthood, will not be released until he is 34 years old. At that point, he will enter supervised release, essentially a form of probation, until he is nearly 50. He will also be a lifelong sex offender, having to wear that cone of shame until the day he dies. The decisions that Tony made as a teenager will heavily impact the rest of his life. It has cost him his reputation, his livelihood, and his freedom. However, the decisions that his victims were forced into making, at the end of Tony's extortion and blackmail attempts, will also heavily impact the rest of their lives. Despite the fact that Tony's case continues to haunt these victims, some of whom still live in New Berlin, Wisconsin, it remains just one incident of an outbreak of similar crimes. Predators throughout the nation, hell, throughout the world, continue to use social media as an outlet for their perversions, a hunting ground for their depraved illegalities. Brad Schimmel, the district attorney for Waukesha County, led the effort to organize and present the case against Anthony Stansel. In addition to fighting for justice, he hoped that this case would alert parents and guardians to the lives their children were living online, oftentimes a life they tried shielding from everyone around them. Quote, I think a lot of parents learned something from this. Usually in child sexual assault cases, the media attention is relatively minor. This one has just attracted a lot of attention because it's bigger than what we're used to. There are people all over the country looking at this, I hope, and questioning what are kids up to? What are kids doing with their photo phones? What are they doing on their computers? There's been this other message beyond just dealing with the defendant and his victims. Despite drawing national attention to the small town of New Berlin, the Eisenhower High School sex scandal remains the area's dirty little secret.